and welcome to this workshop uh, that is organized jointly by the CSAE and Mind and Behavior Research Group. My name is Ondine Berland and I'm a research assistant at the CSAE. So before talking about what brings us here, I'd like to warmly thank uh, the CSAE and Blavetnik School of Government teams uh, for supporting this research initiative. Today we've decided to focus on meta-analysis uh, because this methodology is increasingly used in development economics and we think it's ra raising quite a lot of interest. Um, Meta-analysis, as you might know, is a statistical procedure for combining data from multiple studies. Um, they can be useful as they can help better understanding complex issues, increasing precision uh, of estimates, and even uh, providing external validity. However, meta-analysis can seem cost costly uh, to implement both in terms of required knowledge and in terms of computation. We can also think of other challenges, such as how to choose which type of meta-analysis to run, uh, the options for publishing meta-analysis, and uh, the extent to which we can generalize from impact evaluations. So today, to help us better understand meta how meta-analysis work and address the challenges it raises, we're very lucky to have four excellent presenters so Mark, uh, um, Michael Gester, Eva Vivalt, and Raquel Miger, who should be here soon any minute, but I heard that the trains are a bit delayed. Um, and um, so centering this workshop around a methodology has motivated us to divide the day into masterclass sessions in the morning to present the topic in a technical way and to devote the afternoon to research presentation that will provide several enlightening examples of how meta-analysis can be used. Finally, um, and before giving the speech to Eva, I'd like to say that we are all here because we're truly curious about meta-analysis, so I highly encourage you to participate, and I wish you all a very interesting day. Thank you. And so just... Uh, Briefly before we start, um, there are two sets of people uh, we need to thank. The first are the um, groups who funded this workshop. Um, so uh, uh, Andine spoke about the Mind and Behaviour Group. This is a research stream at the CSAE. Um, we do largely behavioural economics research, but our mandate is both to uh, actually do the research, but also to take interventions that have been judged to work um, and package them in a way that they can be taken to scale um, by policymakers. Of course, what works is a very important question, so that's why we've, we're pretty interested in this technique. Um, and then we've also uh, also got funding from the Global Challenges Research Fund. Um, in particular, Oxford's now hosting um, a large project called Accelerating Adolescence Achievement, uh, led by Professor Lucy Kluver. Um, that's also doing a lot of um, evidence aggregation across countries. So they were very excited that we were doing this. Um, Again, thank you so much to the speakers. I know putting together a masterclass is a labor of love. We're very glad that we, we have the resources to give you a platform to share it with the rest of the world, but we really appreciate your uh, generosity in choosing to do this for us. And then finally, just to say a huge thank you to Andine, who came up with the idea for the workshop, um, herded all of the speakers, got the days, did all of the organization. Um, it's really been fantastic to have you at CSAE, and also you've done a wonderful job. Um, so we'll just give you a round of applause. Okay, so I think we're bang on time to start. So if you want to ask a question just for the live stream, if you can just stick your hand up and then we'll pass the mic back to you. Uh, everyone else can obviously hear you, but the, the online people can't. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you very much for having me here. I think that this is a really good initiative. Um, I think meta-analysis is super important and meta-research more broadly, and I hope that this talk will in part help to motivate and excite you about meta-analysis if you're not already sufficiently excited. So what I'm going to be talking about is first starting with some motivation here, actually. Um, and then getting into some of the nitty-gritty of how you actually do a meta-analysis. And I'll draw upon some examples from Stata and R. 
um, and then get to some other fun things that you can do if you're doing a meta-analysis or you've got already the kinds of data that you would need for a meta-analysis. There's some other applications that you can think of. So for example, looking at publication bias, right? Um, so you had a quick survey already. I'm gonna give you one more quick survey question. Um, familiarity with Stata, raise your hand. <laughs> Versus, okay, everybody basically, R, raise your hand. Okay, so still quite a lot of people, uh, not quite as much. All right, good for me to know, thank you. Um, so taking a step back, why do we do meta-analysis? Why are they important? Here's a figure, um, this is actually from a Vox article, but it's based on a paper by Schoenfeld and Ioannidis, um, where they were essentially showing, look, um, one study can find anything, right? Um, here are some studies results on whether certain kinds of food protect or cause cancer. So we've got wine, well it could protect, it could cause cancer, and so on for any kind of uh, thing that you can think of. Essentially, effect sizes vary a lot. Now obviously you can complain about this figure and say, well, you know, what do you mean like protects against cancer, like there's many kinds of cancer. Um, what do you mean, you know, consumption of wine or tea or whatever? It probably depends on the dose. Um, all those would be fair points. Um, nonetheless, even if you're looking within a more specific um, categorization here, so, um, I don't know, choose your favorite kind of cancer, um, it, you'll still find the same kind of variation, broadly speaking. You might reduce it a little bit, but there'll still be some variation. Um, so any one given study is not all that informative. Moreover, um, if you have results from many different studies, you can learn more about other studies and you can combine some of the estimates to get a more precise estimate of the overall average effect. Um, Research may also be biased, so this figure is from Berdur et al. Um, actually, they've got another paper, or at least um, Berdur does with some other co-authors, um, looking at how um, research could be biased across different types of um, either experiments or quasi-experiments one might want to do. Um, so here, you've got your threshold for significance, and you see this little bump right at the threshold, suggesting that there's either some p-hacking going on, some specification searching, and there's not even just this bump here, but there's almost like some results are stolen, right? It dips down first and then goes back up. Um, so if you've got the kinds of data with which you can do a meta-analysis, you can also do some other kinds of analyses, uh, potentially. Also, studies are very often underpowered, so here is a figure um, where I was looking at the um, observed effect size in my data and the required effect size in order for those same studies to have been well powered. So the required effect size would have been much larger, actually, suggesting many studies are underpowered. Um, Inidis, um, Ducliagos, and Stanley also have a recent a paper in the Economic Journal, I think, looking at how most studies are pretty underpowered, right? And finally, studies are informative about each other. So this table is from Fisher et al. Um, and essentially the way you should read this, these light blue estimates were the original estimates in the paper, pretty much. Um, so you've got your original specifications, but you'll notice there's these dark blue ones which bring them a little bit closer together. What's going on there? Well, those are the posteriors from a Bayesian meta-analysis, Bayesian hierarchical model. Um, and uh, the nice thing about these kinds of models is that they also serve as shrinkage estimators. Um, the intuition being that any one given study is informative about other studies. So imagine you've got like a mass of studies all clustered around zero, say, and you also observe this one other study far out, um, you know, a very positive effect somewhere out there. Um, well, you might start to think, maybe I distrust that result. Um, based on this mass over here, I probably suspect that one, you know, down the hall hallway is actually 
uh, should be a little bit closer to the other ones. So that's the sense in which these are sort of shrinkage estimates. They're sort of shrinking it towards the global mean. Um, and how much they'll shrink depends on the precision of those estimates. So if that really large positive estimate had huge confidence intervals, you would you know, put even less faith in it, right? There might be just something um, wrong with it or it's just inapplicable um, and not the same kind of program or context. So studies can also be informative about each other. Okay, so how do you do a meta-analysis? We're gonna start with the basics here. You need to go through several steps, figure out what topic you're actually doing, um, specify your search and screening criteria and conduct that search and screening. Um, do your data extraction, and then analyze the data. Um, now, there's many different types of criteria you might want to set um, for your search and screening criteria. Um, but um, one of the common things that is used um, here is to specify your population, your intervention, um, comparison groups, outcomes, and study design. Um, but you can really think, you know, making it as detailed or broad as you want. Um, for a lot of the uh, things that I did that you'll hear a little bit more about later, I actually deliberately set the search and screen criteria to be exceptionally broad, wanting to capture basically anything that could, you know, possibly be considered an impact evaluation of X intervention, um, so long as it was in a developing country context. Um, so, um, and was an impact evaluation. <laughs> okay, but you can generally be more narrow. Um, you may also want to consider measures of quality of the studies that you're including. Um, so here's some examples, again, non-exhaustive list of the types of questions you may want to be asking when um, you're considering whether to include a study. Um, so was the study a randomized controlled trial? Was it blinded? This is less relevant for economics. <laughs> economic studies are relevant, <laughs> you know, basically never blinded, but hey. Um, did it at least report attrition? I mean, ideally you'd also have, you know, what was attrition, if, <laughs> but uh, some, you know, did it report some things? Um, you could even, you know, make, so some of these are, you know, from the health literature, you often have, you know, the first couple of ones of those. Um, I would be excited if in the future people actually look at whether the hypotheses were pre-specified. <laughs> I'm not sure that's, you know, obviously now um, uh, pre-analysis plans are growing. Um, up to this point, I'm not sure we've really had enough of those pre-specified studies to use this as a realistic screening criterion, but maybe in the future, you know, I can dream. Um, you might think about where it was published. Uh, this is a little bit of a double-edged sword. Um, you generally will want to be pretty inclusive, covering the unpublished as well as published literature. And you might think that um, those papers that get into th the top journals might themselves be selected in a certain way so that their, the treatment effects that they've got are perhaps systematically different from um, the treatment effects elsewhere. So, you know, this can go either way. Um, but these are the general types of questions you may want to be asking yourself. Um, and you can even, you know, make some kind of rubric for yourself where you assign points to these things and add them up and include a study if it meets some threshold. Um, it's a little bit up to you, but you've got to justify it. Okay. So here's just an example um, based on my own work of some uh, search and screening processes um, just to illustrate that it's a long and tedious process. Um, <laughs> So often, you know, undertaken with many people in a group to lighten the load. Um, you've got um, you know, testing out your search sources and developing what search strings you're actually going to use. Um, and then what we did was some scripted searches um, where essentially, we, you know, we wrote a bot that uh, helped with some of this, um, as well as doing some manual searches as well. Um, screened out those duplicates. Um, we also had to develop some screening criteria and then uh, screened uh, based on first the titles of the papers, then the abstracts of the papers. Um, so, the, you know, there's a multiple step process here. And I should mention that for all of this, it's double entry. Then that's kind of the norm. 
uh, having two people um, doing screening or doing data entry, and then, um, especially for data entry, um, and then if there's any uh, differences in those, how those two people are coding something, to have some third person come in and um, arbitrate the dispute. Okay, so finally we are getting to data extraction um, and reconciliation of those, that double entry coding uh, data, and we get some finalized raw data. Great. Um, depending on what you're doing with this, you may also want to standardize those data. Um, so, you know, we had some standardization and ended up with some finalized standardized data. Okay, so once you've got some data, you're going to probably have to do some amount of manipulation of that data uh, before getting it into a format where you can really analyze it. Um, Importantly, studies will report results in all sorts of different ways. Uh, so you might have one study, for example, that reports um, a treatment coefficient and the standard error on that estimate, right? Um, and you'll get another study that will say, well, here is the um, mean in the treatment group, the standard deviation in the treatment group, the number of observations in the treatment group, and here is the mean in the control group, the standard deviation in the control group, the number of observations in the control group, and you've got to somehow make these comparable, right? So um, you'll, um, and there's other uh, ways that, you know, data could be represented. Um, sometimes, especially for health studies, you'll have um, binary two by two things. So, um, you know, the typical example is, um, somebody died or didn't die under the treatment group or the control group, right? Um, so again, depending with the literature on the literature you're working with, um, you may have to convert different kinds of data. Um, some of them can be converted to many different things. Some of them, the conversion only goes one way, or you have to make some additional assumptions. Um, so I'm not going to get into all the details on those kinds of things. Um, if you encounter this situation, uh, the, Co the uh, Cochrane Handbook has a lot of um, ways to convert one thing to another thing as a general resource. Um, I think this may be less of an issue if you're sticking with economic studies because most things will be in a regression table and you'll get your coefficient and your standard error and it'll be easy, you know, done. Okay. And I should mention, I mean, one thing that is maybe more difficult with economic studies is you'll have a lot of different specifications being reported. So when you're developing your data extraction manual, et cetera, you're going to have to specify, well, which specification are you going for? Um, so I don't know. For some reason, econ seems to report loads more results on the same um, outcome. Um, in my experience, at least, potentially it's um, area dependent. Okay, all right, um, so I'll get into analysis, but before going there, I just want to put up some references. Um, so, you know, what you read will depend on your baseline familiarity with this topic. I wanted to be somewhat inclusive here. So, um, the simplest one on this list, I would guess, would be this Bornstein et al., um, or the Cochrane Handbook for that matter. Um, and those are pretty gentle intro to meta-analysis, what's the fixed effects model, what's the random effects model, and so on. Um, there's also, these sites are pretty good for just basic, you know, how do you do a meta-analysis in Stata, what's available, or how do you do a meta-analysis in R. Um, again, this is sort of focusing on um, as an introduction. <laughs> um, this is not um, your full um, Bayesian hierarchical models, except for Gelman et al. certainly gets into that. Um, but otherwise, this is a pretty gentle introduction. Okay, so how should um, you th be thinking of analysis here? Can I use this water, by the way? Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, three basic types of models. Uh, you've got fixed effects models, random effects models, and mixed models. In your fixed effects world, there is one true effect that all studies are seeking to estimate. 
Um, you can think of this as potentially applicable in the situation in which you've got replications. So in this world, there's no heterogeneity in treatment effects. All the studies are estimating the exact same thing. Um, then there's the random effects world where true studies, true effects may actually vary by study. Okay? So there is heterogeneity in treatment effects. Um, so maybe, you know, studies vary by context. Maybe the intervention itself was even slightly different um, from one study to another. And you can also build a mixed model where the true effects can vary and you think you can explain some of that. Um, okay. So here is just sort of graphically an image from Bornstein et al, um, where you've got you know, two studies. They've got different sampling variances, but you can see they've got the same mean. They are estimating the same thing um, here. At least you know, theoretically, they're estimating the same thing. Um, any variation is just going to be your sampling error. Okay, That's what this model assumes. And one way to write that down um, would be like this. Um, you've got some point estimates, y sub i, and you've got some true effect theta. And theta doesn't vary. It's not subscripted. It's just theta. And you've got some error term. And here I'm saying your error term is normally distributed um, with some uh, sampling variance, um, sigma i squared. OK? Simple. Um, Great. Now, I mean, more generally, you can think of meta-analysis as essentially being some kind of weighted average. So you need to pick some kind of weighting rule. Um, some plausible things, um, you know, maybe you want to weight by sample size or more specifically the inverse of the variance. Um, the reason this would make some sense is if you think that um, some results are simply less precise than others. Maybe you trust the results that are more precise more. Seems possible. Um, so you can simply just uh, have your weights be the inverse of the variance. <laughs> um, and then um, you can create your mean, um, which, you know, the weighted average, essentially, weighted by those weights. Um, and the variance um, will have that form at the end. Right, of, the, of your meta-analysis estimate, essentially. Okay? So this is all still in the fixed effects world. Um, let's look at how things look in the random effects model. Here, you can have some variation in your treatment effects. So these underlying distributions in study one and study two you think are different. Um, and there's still some sampling variance in each of those two studies, but they are each trying to estimate a different thing. You may still do a meta-analysis and estimate the grand mean, um, which is here represented by mu, but nonetheless, each of those two studies has got a different intrinsic effect size associated with it, right? Okay. So here's how you can represent that. Um, you've got some point estimates, um, still your y sub i's, um, but now you've got theta sub i in there. Um, and so it has an i subscript. They vary by study. Um, and while you still have some variance from um, the error term here, your sampling variance, you also have some true interstudy heterogeneity um, where uh, the variance there is tau squared. Okay, so you've got two sources of error now, or variance now, essentially. Okay, now there's many ways you can try to um, estimate uh, tau squared. Um, a very common thing that people use is Gersimonia and Laird. Um, not great, <laughs> um, but you know it's a thing that people could use. Um, you could also try maximum likelihood, empirical bays. Um, there's this uh, correction that uh, Siddiq Jonkman and some other people also made, and a full bays. You know, it depends how much in detail you want to go in this and exactly what you're using it for, and also on some um, attributes of the studies you're trying to combine. So, um, for example, uh, there's a moment you Laird. Um, so like, like any kind of estimators, 
you're going to have to worry about bias and precision, um, essentially efficiency, right? Um, so you're often going to get some slightly biased estimates um, with um, Dersimoni and Laird. Um, it's not the most precise. Um, you can get something that is um, uh, sort of uh, maximally efficient using maximum likelihood, but it could be more biased. So there's this trade-off here between bias variance. Uh, let me finish this, and then I'm going to do that. Okay, and then you can go to empirical bays. Um, um, if you are trying to do this in, um, you should you should watch out for whether it's converging or not. Um, so um, I believe somebody should correct me if I'm wrong on this. I believe that R will tell you if you are not converging on this, but Stata will not if you're using the canned packages. Um, and uh, you know you can go to your full um, full Bayes approximation. Um, I'll talk about a little bit here, um, but um, I'll leave most of that to Rachel next. Um, you had a question. Uh, we need the microphone, I guess. What is? Do we need the microphone? For the online audience, um, the Dersimonian Laird estimator. What is it? What's the formula for it? So it's essentially putting. A, so I don't have the formula here, and I don't think I could say it off the top of my head. Um, but it's very close to um, just using the inverse variance weighting rule, um, adjusting for essentially the number of studies and their own individual precision. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it's just a, an additional formula that I can't represent here at the moment. Okay. Um, some of these are more sensitive or less sensitive to if you've got a small number of studies. Um, now, I've got to say, like, while I'm talking about the differences between all these estimators, generally speaking, they'll arrive at something pretty similar unless you try to design a situation where you're going to get different results. Um, so um, you can imagine especially um, some of the, the margins that you could, you know, play around with are a small number of studies. Um, there's someone in there, you might want, not want to do that for a small number of studies, potentially. Um, although, um, if you've got a small number and very imprecise studies, um, even your, your fully Bayesian approximation will depend then a lot on the priors. So there's, you know, various trade-offs at various points here. Um, you can also think of um, whether the studies are of relatively equal weight to one another versus one of those studies is... Um, much more precise than the other ones. Um, so that will also a little bit affect this. Um, there's all sorts of simulations um, that you can find online of you know, when one performs a little bit better than another. Um, it's not, I think, very easily summarizable because of these different kinds of dimensions along which things can vary. Um, OK. But generally speaking, I mean, you should get pretty much the same thing, right? OK. Um, so here's an example of a mixed model. Um, you can think of this as just, you know, you've got some um, explanatory variable. Um, so for example, you're looking at the effect of conditional cash transfers on enrollment rates, and you think, well, the baseline enrollment rates should really matter in figuring out what the treatment effect is, um, or, you know, in what that treatment effect actually is. So for example, it's a lot easier to improve enrollment rates if you're starting from a baseline of like 50% as opposed to a baseline of, you know, 99%. Um, so you want to account for that in your model. Um, so you know those baseline enrollment rates in different places, hopefully. Um, side note, studies do not tend to report all the things you want them to report, and it's very, very frustrating. Please, as you're writing papers, report all the things. Um, and, uh, but if you have that data, great, you can put it in um, and um, try to um, estimate this kind of model. Um, so here, um, you'll still have your... Um, Sampling variance, you'll still have some true interstudy variance, but you might think that um, since you've explained some of the variance um, in these different effects uh, from one study to another, that sort of residual variance will be a little bit smaller. Um, you can think of tau squared here as kind of your unexplained heterogeneity um, that remains. Um, 
side note, um, so who here has heard of the term exchangeability? We should put our Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you guys know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for that wonderful question. Um, exchangeability is um, essentially this notion that um, you don't, um, studies are exchangeable with one another. You don't know enough about them um, to uh, be able to distinguish them on any characteristics you know. So, for example, if I thought that baseline enrollment rates were really super important, but I just didn't have that data for these studies, then the studies would look exchangeable from my perspective. Um, and in that case, I might have to sort of do a random effects model um, rather than try to model them in a more complicated way. Um, essentially, you can typically justify a random effects model by saying something like, well, I just don't know anything about these studies um, on which to build a better model. Um, these studies look like they are um, from the same distribution as far as I can tell, um, and I've you know, got no other reason to believe that they're different. It's not to say, you know, you don't have to say uh, these studies are, you know, definitely all the same. You can just say from a place of ignorance, I don't know or I don't have the data. Um, okay. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's move on to some nitty gritty and Stata and in R. Um, there's some packages you can use in both these programs. Um, in Stata, for example, there's this command metan, um, where um, you can estimate loads of different things here. So, for example, um, you know, you can put in your uh, treatment effect, um, lower confidence interval, upper confidence interval, um, and specify whether you're looking for fixed or random effects. Um, if you're in one of those two by two situations, um, where you've got, you know, uh, deaths in the treatment groups, um, those who didn't die in the treatment group, the number of deaths in the control group, and the number of people who didn't die in the control group, great. You can put that in. Um, you can put in, you know, um, your um, treatment sample size, treatment mean, treatment standard deviation, control group sample size, control mean, control standard deviation. Um, you can um, look at things where, um, they're initially um, something that you want to take the log of, um, and taking the log will put it into a form where you can simply think of it as almost like a treatment effect and standard error, so um, you can uh, still um, analyze uh, data that are geometric by first taking the log. Um, by default, Stata will use something um, called the Mantle-Hansel method, um, if you just say fixed or random. Um, again, it shouldn't really actually make much of a difference um, if you use fixed or random versus fixed I or random I, which are, is the inverse variance uh, weighted um, version. It really honestly won't make a difference. I've yet to encounter a case where it will. I mean, I'm sure it will sometimes in these artificial scenarios, but just Nonetheless, it's probably good practice to always specify, you know, fixed I or random I if that's what you want, um, just so that you know what you are in fact doing, um, and don't forget that. <laughs> um, so I guess this is sort of the basics. Um, there's a lot of options. If you know, you just look at the help file for this particular command, you can get a lot more options there. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's I think pretty straightforward. Um, in R, there's, you know, a couple packages you might want to use. Here's some examples um, there. You can find more examples, by the way, yeah, either in the help files or in those earlier links I provided for, as references in state R. R. Um, so there's a meta package. Um, so in particular, if you've got data that looks like, oh, here's my treatment effect, here's my standard error, um, you can... Um, use this, you know, metagen, or very similarly for if you've got, you know, number in the tr treatment group, mean in the treatment group, um, standard deviation in the treatment group, and the same thing for the control group. Again, like, all this depends on what kinds of data um, you've got. Um, 
which again is a little bit weird because some of these you can convert between, so you kind of don't need all these functions really, but you know they're supposed to make your life a little bit easier, so there they are. Um, and you can specify, hey, do I want um, a fixed effects model? Hey, do I want you know, a random effects model? Um, just by sort of manipulating some of these inputs. Um, and here, um, this is your summary measure. I'm looking at a standardized mean difference. Um, so you can think of, you know, some uh, times you'll have something like, um, say, a, a risk ratio or something here instead for your standardized, so, sorry, for your um, um, uh, measure. Okay. So there's this option as well that you can put in that will um, tell you, tell R what kind of estimate you want to get. So are you using Dersimonian and Laird? For example, you'll put in your method dot tau is this thing. Uh, do you want maximum likelihood? Do you want empirical Bayes? Um, and there's some other options in there as well. Um, so you can tell it what exactly you want it to do. Um, all right. Um, so you might also have you know, binary data. Um, so again, think of those um, two by two um, count data. Um, and um, I should mention that there's also this alternative package metaphor, um, which has a lot of the same types of options. Um, you just, you know, it's a slightly different package. Things are put in in a slightly different way. Um, you've got some methods you can put in. So fixed effects, say. Um, you've got, got some other choices, but um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, question. Uh, let's get, give the mic back there. Somehow, if you've got a laptop in front of you, you could, could even play around with this. But I see that not everybody's got one, so um, although a lot of people do. Uh, so in the Stanley and Dukiliagos book, they basically say something like, "You should not bother with any of these packages, and you should just do everything in like normal regression." Like, what's the take on that then? If you're recommending all these packages, um, I mean, you can. So certainly, like um, any kind of mixed model is just another kind of regression. Um, and um, I mean, you can certainly do that. Um, honestly, I think that it's still, so I, what I would probably do is myself would be a full Bayesian approach. And I wouldn't honestly bother with any of this stuff. Um, but nonetheless, I think that you know, if you're just getting started with meta-analysis and you want an easy way that to say, hey, I want these this particular kind of method of, you know, estimating tau squared or whatever, then in that sense it can be helpful. Yeah. I mean, it's off the shelf. It's, you know, it's going to have typical advantages of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of funny things about meta-analyses. Um, one is that people tend to think of them as like highly different from any other kind of regression that you're doing, um, when actually um, they're, they're not. <laughs> and two, um, I do think it's really weird how they name uh, fixed and random effects. That will always cause confusion in an economics literature, um, because in a way you might think that a random effects model is actually closer to what economists would think of as having some kind of fixed effect because every study essentially, you're thinking every study has its own fixed effect as it were, but yet somehow in the meta-analysis literature that's called random effects model. So there's just some communication barriers here. Um, you know, these two literatures did not talk with one another <laughs> and now we're stuck. Other questions before I move on? Okay. so. Um, Bayesian hierarchical models. Um, I'm going to leave most of this for Rachel, um, but basically um, you do the same kind of thing where you, um, you have got, you can think of the same kinds of models underlying this, except you've got some prior distribution uh, for your mu and you've got some prior distribution for your tau, um, which you update using data um, and then you can draw a posterior distribution. Um, <laughs> I've done uh, this in R in a long, hard way that I would not uh, suggest one does by literally like writing out all the equations. Um, and oh, that was painful. Um, so it seems like Rachel has got some new packages instead. So I recommend that. Um, 
Um, and she'll tell you about that soon, I think. Um, there's going to be some checks you're going to want to do if you're doing the full Bayesian hierarchical model. Um, so first, you've got actually the right functional form in your model. Um, so remember, like for example, in this um, random effects model, we're saying, hey, everything is normally distributed. Um, maybe things are not normally distributed. Maybe it's reasonable to think that the sampling variance is normal, but maybe the distribution of studies is not normally distributed. Maybe it's uh, log normal or something. Um, so you've got the right distribution, and then uh, the other big check, how sensitive are your results, in fact, to the priors that you selected? Um, so if your results are very sensitive to those priors, you would want to know that. Um, and maybe. Um, justify your priors better, show a different range of them, many specifications. Um, yeah. Okay. So, as there's still a little bit more time, I want to get into some other fun things to do <laughs> if you're uh, doing meta research in general. Um, again, to just help motivate this is a fun thing that everybody should do. <laughs> uh, so, you can try to model and characterize some of that heterogeneity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's helpful to interpret uh, study results in light of other studies. You can estimate uh, research biases, um, and I'll talk through some other ways of leveraging the Bayesian model more broadly. So, characterizing heterogeneity. Well, you'll hear a little bit more about this this afternoon when I'm talking, but um, there's uh, some measures that you might want to use um, that you think of as intuitive measures of heterogeneity in some sense. So you can think of either the variance of the point estimates, but wait, what we actually care about is perhaps the true interstudy variance, um, you know, abstracting from uh, taking away sampling variance. Um, you can try to um, create a um, scaled measure, the coefficient of variation, which is a unitless measure. It's essentially the inverse of the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, or this I squared term, um, which is uh, the, essentially the share of the total variance that um, is true heterogeneity that's not sampling variance. Um, each possible measure is going to be flawed. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the afternoon. Um, so, okay. You can also say, look, studies are informative about each other. Um, if you've got, I was already talking through this uh, slide, if you've got a mass of studies in one place and then see this other study down the hall, well, um, that's probably saying that other study, there's you know, something different about it in some way. Maybe it's incorrect, maybe it's biased, maybe it's also just you know, from a different context and shouldn't be lumped in with the others. Um, but in any case, if you do think that, yes, it should be part of this, then this mass of studies over here is informative about that one over there. Okay, you'd like to model heterogeneity. <laughs> Unfortunately, you won't be able to do too much with that, um, generally speaking. Um, I mean, I think you can do more of that if you've got micro data. Um, if you're just looking at your uh, point estimates and standard errors for a whole bunch of studies, you're generally not going to have enough studies to be able to run meta regressions, really. Um, so, yeah, that's a problem. Um, I mean, I think at this point, you're lucky to be able to do meta-analyses at all in economics. Um, the health literature has, you know, more studies that tend to be on the same um, type of thing. Um, in the education literature, they do this thing where they also um, sort of aggregate up different kinds of indicators to just generally say something like, you know, the effect of this program on education. Um, and, you know, there's trade-offs, there's pros and cons. I mean, yes, you'll then be able to find more studies that are broadly in some way, shape, or form on education. But at the same time, what does that outcome mean? Like, you might be com combining in there, you know, enrollment rates and um, some other things. So it depends on what are you, you know, your purpose is. Um, if you are trying to look at, um, you know, true... Uh, heterogeneity and trying to figure out the sources of heterogeneity, maybe you want to do to, you know, keep them separate and be very, very specific. If um, you do want to do something that um, is more broad and you're kind of limited by having too few studies, well, you can sort of expand your definition. So, you know, how you exactly want to set that threshold is a little bit up to you, depending on your purposes. 
But yeah, this is still generally a problem. I wish people used more comparable outcome variables. Um, so, question. Oh, let's get you, get you the mic. A comment. Yeah, so I just want to say at this point, if you're doing meta-analyses in economics, your referees are going to try to make you do meta-regression um, because it's often done in other literatures when it actually even, like, I mean, there's, there's much, many more studies of any given thing in medicine than we have in applied economics um, for reasons that are somewhat unclear to me. Um, but they shouldn't even be doing meta-regression in medicine. Like, they don't have enough studies that are comparable. They're, they're throwing lots of stuff in. Um, so the, the reason why referees in economics don't understand this and why referees in medicine probably also don't understand this is because we don't talk about overfitting as a concept. So we don't have a notion of like, if you've got 10 studies or 20 studies or 50 studies and you have like 15 or 20 variables at the study level, you should not be fitting an ordinarily squares regression. Um, the best you can do is something like a ridge regression or a lasso. Even that, uh, typically people will want you to tune those via cross-validation. You can't do cross-validation with 50 data points. Uh, the cross-validation sample error is going to be horrific. Uh, and unfortunately, like, regularization is not necessarily stable, so coefficients can cross each other at different tuning parameter values. So the best you can do is probably like try a bunch of tuning. Like you should, you should definitely do some regularization. Like you would never want to do a non-regularized uh, uh, meta regression, but um, try and do it at a couple of different tuning parameters. Uh, and if your referees really push you on this, you can try and do the cross validation. Typically, what will happen is the cross validation will just give you garbage. Like it will say like nothing is selected, nothing explains anything. Um, so then that usually shuts people up. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so generally not enough data for this. You might have to do it anyways, but there's, you know, generally it's limited. Okay, things you can do. Um, funnel plots. You might have heard of funnel plots. I kind of hope so. Um, you uh, essentially, um, these kind of plots you can see here, you've got your standardized mean difference, for example, and your standard error um, on these two axes. And you're essentially trying to look at I mean, very vaguely speaking here, do these things look symmetric? <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, I think I'm a little bit sick. Um, or is it the case that there's some systematic, um, um, so for example, you know, things which have a very high um, standardized mean difference also have got a high standard error here. Um, in which case you might think, well, do I really trust that variable, that, that one study result? Um, so. You're essentially looking for whether things look symmetric. And there's things that you can do. I'll talk about limitations shortly. Um, there's things you can do in state R and R for this. Um, so you know, there's lots of packaged commands. Um, you can make uh, funnel plots with meta funnel. You can uh, do some various tests for that asymmetry using meta bias. Um, there's this trim and fill method, um, which I mean, essentially, you are saying, well, I think there's some studies that are missing here, essentially, and um, you're just trying to adjust it and make up some studies to try to um, get what the studies might look like if they weren't subject to p-hacking or whatnot or whatever other biases. Um, it's a little bit um, controversial. Um, overall, I would say these methods have some pretty heroic assumptions embedded <laughs> in them. Um, in R, you can do the same kind of thing, um, but question for the audience here, why do you think a funnel plot is maybe not the best way of going about this? I mean, I've kind of said, hey, this is pretty heroic, but does anybody, <laughs> I mean, this is maybe a format that is not conducive to being particularly interactive, but nonetheless. I know Rachel and Mike know. <laughs> yeah, it's cheating. 
Okay, sure, yeah, no, so here's a final plot. So essentially, think of, you know, plotting your standardized mean difference against your standard error, and then using that to infer how much um, publication bias or p-hacking you think there is here. Well, I don't think it does work, <laughs> but I can tell you why one might think. So, um, you know, suppose you've got, um, like, look at this, like, really big um, coefficient. It's really huge, and it also has a large standard error. And you're thinking, hmm, like, that's a little bit suspicious looking. Um, why is it not the case that, why is it that I only observe large point estimates when I've got really huge imprecise estimates? Like, don't I think that really those should be distributed independently in some sense? That there should be some studies that were very precisely estimated that also had um, large uh, point estimates? Um, So, sorry, um, so we're not having actually, per se, uh, p-values here, although you can kind of infer them. A, 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 oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, so, okay. So you can look at, like, the amount, like, inside or outside that range. Um, and um, you've got the uh, significant ones um, where you've got... Um, yeah, so you've got the significant ones with um, smaller um, standard errors. Um, but uh, here, okay, so maybe I should just get to the, the answer to this because I'm also going to run out of time in a few minutes. Um, so here's an example from Yuri Simonson on his really wonderful blog, Data Collada, where he has simulated this thing. I mean, ultimately what's important kind of here is like this, like, is there some slope to this almost? Um, and he's kind of simulated this without any kind of uh, publication bias at all, just saying, look, I suspect that there's some relationship, some true relationship between sample size and um, the effects here. And there's many ways you can think that this would arise. Um, so, for example, um, you might think, well, it's a larger study, maybe um, they ended up um, including some people who were not precisely targeted for it to work, you know, absolutely the best on, um, maybe, you know, this increase in sample size means worse targeting and therefore lower effect sizes, or increased sample size, uh, maybe there's less capacity to implement the program, or, I mean, you can think of like 12 different reasons probably for why you might um, think this pattern to potentially be the case without any kind of p-hacking going on. Um, so, this is a little bit sketchy. <laughs> People do it a lot, but um, I wouldn't really recommend it for this purpose. Um, ideally, you know, you can try to um, argue for uh, what component is publication bias in some other way. Um, so, I, you know, in the future when we've got these nice uh, pre-specified, enough studies that are pre-specified, we could maybe, you know, turn to look at those ones as potentially immune from these same kinds of biases, or registered reports for that matter. Okay, but I mean, that world is a far way off. Um, Nonetheless, you know, you can try to look at biases um, through other methods. So Berdur et al. use caliper tests, for example. Um, a caliper test is essentially you're taking some little band around 1.96, and you're saying, do I see more results just to the right of 1.96 versus just to the left? Um, because if so, that's a little bit suspicious. And this becomes more credible if you've got smaller bands. You know, like, just right at 1.96, if you look at, like, I don't know, 1.961 or something, um, it shouldn't look that much different than 1.59, right? Those things should look pretty similar. Um, as you increase the bands, it is a little bit harder to say what's going on, um, just because 
I guess one worry that one might have is that you've actually got some kind of um, different underlying distribution here um, for what those uh, treatment effects should be. Um, so, you know, you can argue with things, but essentially if you've got really, really narrow calipers, this is a very credible way of testing for things. There's a question back there, and then I'm pretty much done with time. Yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how do those work in a sense? Yeah, um, so P curves are great. Um, so this is actually also uh, Yuri Simonson et al. Um, they actually, so now actually it's kind of nice. To, so they had this website, you can you know check out things that for uh, P curves there and like enter in your values and get what that P curve looks like. Um, there's also an R package that will do it now. Um, um, look, right, like you say, like this, you need a lot of data. P curves you can do um, with whatever data you've got, essentially. Although, again, you'll want a lot of them. Um, the other issue, um, really, with P curves is this assumption that um, studies are um, estimating similar types of things and not different in some particular way from one another. Um, so um, there's some other assumptions there. Um, yeah, I wish I had slides on the P-curve. I don't. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> um, but we can chat later about it, and uh, I certainly encourage you all to look it up. And uh, like I say, they've tried to make it very easy for people to learn about it. They've got like this little app on their website. It's very snazzy. Um, okay. Um, so I just wanted to very briefly mention some other biases you can estimate. Um, there's, you know, false positive or false negative report rate probabilities. Um, there's uh, this modified FPRP or FNRP because uh, Luke kind of embarrassingly found that the original Wachholder paper was not totally kosher. Um, which, so there's a modified version. There's Bayesian false discovery probability or conditional error probability. These papers will talk about that. Essentially, you need some kind of prior, and if you've got some kind of prior, the intuition is that if you see results that seem very unlikely to you, that seem really different from your prior, either those results are more likely um, to be, well, they're both more likely to be wrong, um, and um, if they're right, uh, they help you learn a lot more. So they're either really, really cool or a little bit suspect. Um, but uh, both interpretations are completely, um, I mean, from Bayesian perspective, they're analogous in a way. Okay, but you need to collect priors for that. Um, the other way that you can estimate biases, um, so oftentimes you'll see people, um, like in this, in this paper, using meta-analysis results um, as essentially what um, one should have found, in a sense. Um, and they use a meta-analysis result to look at power and come to the conclusion that most studies are underpowered. Um, I would agree that most studies are underpowered. Um, I think a little bit, it's a little bit, there's a tension here because they use fixed effects meta-analysis to try to prove this point, arguing that random effects meta-analyses um, will be biased, will be more sensitive to any kind of latent publication bias or p-hacking. Um, and they're right about that, but at the same time, um, using fixed effects meta-analyses may also be a little bit controversial in economics if you've got, you know, a, probably some true heterogeneity between the studies that you're combining. Um, there's also these um, type S for sign or type M for magnitude errors um, that Gilman and Carlin, <coughs> excuse me, get into, um, and Gilman and Torlinks as well. Okay. Um, you can also like learn about learning. So there's lots of things you can do once you estimate some of these parameters is all I'm trying to say. You can learn the value of information in another study. You can do lots of things. Okay, so to just sum up, because I think I'm out of time, um, essentially meta-analyses are only as good as the methods that you're using, like any kind of research that we do. Um, they can be biased. Um, you can, in fact, register your meta-analysis with Cochrane. Um, and um, try to document what you're doing, at least in sufficient detail that somebody else could replicate it and ideally version your data if you're um, 
updating it. Um, so those, I'll just leave it there and yeah, leave time for any questions, I guess, but thanks.